on my far live. Yeah. So good morning and welcome to the Arizona Commerce Authority's Small Business Boot Camp. My name is Faith Ritchie and I'm subbing in for usual host, Robert Theobald. For those of you who may be new to the Small Business um, Boot Camp, we always like to start our acknowledgement and thanks to our many community partners because without them, we would not be able to provide such quality content to our entrepreneurs statewide. The Small Business Boot Camp is a weekly webinar series to help entrepreneurs prepare, plan, and grow their business in Arizona. And it is supported by our many community partners. Additionally, we do record all of our boot camp sessions to be provided in our content library. So if you are looking to discover a new topic or you're wanting to dive deeper, into a previously heard conversation. We welcome you to join that content library to review those recordings as well as the slide deck provided by our presenters. So as I mentioned for today, today's recording and slide deck will also be a part of that content library later this week. Now, hopefully you are familiar with some of these programs provided by the Arizona Commerce Authority, but if you are interested or looking for additional resources and guidance, we welcome you again to visit our website. That link will be shared in the chat to learn more about what the Arizona Commerce Authority can do to help your business. The Small Business Checklist is an online and an interactive guide to help you identify all of those commonly asked questions as it relates to starting a business in Arizona. Again, whether you are looking to start, operate, or grow, the checklist is a great free resource for you to identify all of your needs getting started. Now for some small business updates, and we're excited to share that our update portion of our bootcamp webinars will now be included in weekly email reminders. But first, State 48 Foundation will begin their entrepreneur speaker series each Wednesday evening in September. This is a free in-person opportunity, and you can learn more about the program as well as registration in the chat. Additionally, um, the SBA and other community partners will be providing the Challenge Her Phoenix for those who are interested in federal contracting. These are both free opportunities and registration is required. So again, I encourage you find those links in the chat to learn more about those programs. Oh, and apologies for this. Uh, obviously, we know today, day unneeded <laughs> for our upcoming sessions, um, but closing out for August, we will talk about embracing brand authenticity in coffee cat culture. It's a common question that we get for businesses looking to expand and broaden their brand. And ending this month, we have Mastering the P&L. Um, while this topic may feel daunting, it is so necessary. And we are so excited for this presenter because they always make this topic enjoyable. So if you are having challenges um, with Mastering the P&L or if you're looking to embrace your brand authenticity, again, join us Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m. for those sessions. But for the reason we are all here, um, I want to introduce and welcome Sam Kapoor of Arizona Elite Commercial. Um, Sam has over 25 years of extensive business experience and here to talk to us today about commercial real estate. We want to welcome Sam for his presentation with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn the time over to you, Sam. Thanks, Faith. I appreciate it. Yeah, as Faith mentioned, um, I've got over 25 years of business experience. Uh, I'm a commercial real estate broker now with Arizona Elite Commercial. Um, and the, you know, mo most of or all of my experience really 
has been in small, medium sized businesses as an owner and operator and uh, as a consultant. Um, and because of that, I've been able to see a lot of different industries and a lot of different businesses, um, which helps me then relate a little bit more to the challenges faced by everybody um, in, in different places when they're looking for commercial real estate. Um, as, as a broker, one of the big reasons I decided to become a commercial real estate broker, and, and I don't know if anybody out there has had challenges uh, with this, I was actually looking to open a new business, looking at some franchises, and I just couldn't get any information uh, out there about commercial real estate. I engaged with commercial real estate brokers, couldn't get them to call me back. So it was really difficult as a small, medium-sized business. Now, if you're a large corporation, I think Intel probably doesn't struggle too much of getting commercial real estate agents to give them a call back and have those resources. But as a small, medium-sized business, it is a little bit more challenging to be able to get that kind of information. So I decided, you know, why don't I utilize my background and help other small businesses and medium-sized businesses in the challenge that they might face it in being educated on commercial real estate and then being able to find commercial real estate properly. Um, so Today, we're going to talk about a couple different topics uh, within the commercial real estate realm. And we're going to start with how to find a location. Uh, then we'll talk about what it is that it takes to qualify as a small business, um, any kind of associated costs with getting commercial real estate, uh, and then the process uh, that you would go through in order to secure that. The, re uh, the last thing we're going to talk about are the leases. And the reason I put that last is because that's really the most complicated part about this. And I think where a lot of people um, really need that education because you know the lease is the contract that we're going to be utilizing in commercial real estate. And if you don't understand how the lease works, that's where you really expose yourself to a lot of risk as a small business. So we're going to dive a little deeper into that. Uh, we'll get plenty of time to speak about uh, what's what, how, what, how the leases work. Um, one of the things that I want to ask everybody now, we've all heard location, location, location. And uh, the most important part about any business is their location. Uh, that's kind of true. And that's kind of not true because I feel that's really highly geared towards a retail establishment, a retail business. But in commercial real estate, there's a bunch of other asset classes as well. So we've got retail, we have office, and we have industrial. There was one asset class that we're not going to be discussing here that's multifamily because that doesn't really necessarily relate to small businesses, but that is an asset class that a lot of investors would go after. So um, we're going to launch a quick poll. I want to see what does your business utilize? Now you can, this is multiple choice, so you can actually choose multiple ones. So does your business utilize, would it utilize a retail space, an office space, or an industrial space if we were going to look for commercial real estate? So we'll just... and. You know, some people might need a warehouse, but they also then need an office for their, their headquarters. So if that's the case, go ahead and choose multiple ones. Um, this way we can gear a little bit more as well towards what it is that you guys need, right? Because um, I deal in all different asset classes besides multifamily. So let me know, Albert, when we get that. Perfect. All right. Well, this is um, a little bit different than what I actually thought. Because my assumption was that a lot of people were going to be retail here. This is split evenly, basically. So we've got 46% on retail, 50% on office, and 38% on industrial. Great. All right, good. So let's talk about this, right? We've got the three different asset classes. Now, location is extremely important for retail, most retail, right? Some I have a, a client who does physical therapy. They're in a retail environment. Um, the, all of their clients really come from referrals from other physical therapists and doctors. They need to be visible in the sense that people need to be able to find them, but they don't need to be able to find them while they're walking by. And no one's going to stop and be like, hey, you know, there's a physical therapy office. Let's just jump in and see if they can help us. That typically doesn't happen for them. Um, but what's important to retail might not be important to office, might not be important to industrial. So some of the main ones, demographics, that's going to be very important to retail. Visibility, most of the time, it's going to be important to retail. Uh, if we're looking at something like how many amps and volts are there, well, that's going to be more geared towards industrial. Um, weight limits, how thick is the concrete? What kind of uh, load factor can the concrete have on it? Most likely, 
you're not going to have really, really heavy equipment in retail. So industrial is where we're going to look at those kinds of things. Um, and then parking. So parking is going to be in both office and retail. So how many spots are there for our clients to come in? But then in, in the, on the office side, how many spots are there for us to be able to have employees that are coming in as well? All right. Looks like my clicker stopped working. There we go. Um, so let's look at the retail side first, right? We've got, just lost something. There we go. All right. So we're looking at the retail side first. Now with retail there, we've got a lot of different things that we want to look at. We've got demographic. We want to see what the traffic is that's going past our store. Uh, the consumer spending, daytime employment reports. Um, you also want to make sure that you've got the right signage because you might be able to, so if it depends on the municipality, it also depends on the center that you're in and the landlord on what kind of signs you can put in there. Um, are you going to be on the monument sign that everybody sees when they come in? Are you not going to be on that monument sign? Are you going to have to pay for that? Sometimes you do, sometimes it's extra, sometimes you might not even have the access to it. Um, then parking. Can your clients park near you? Is it really tough for them to find parking so they can't even come to your establishment? Um, what other tenants are there in the complex? Are they complimentary? Are they going to be taking away your clients? Uh, is it Is there a drive-through? The other aspect that we're going to also think about is what kind of build-out is there? Is the current layout of the space okay or are we going to have to do tenant improvements to get that space to where we want it and how much will those tenant improvements be if we're let's say we're going to be putting in a restaurant and right now the place is an at&t store well we got to take into consideration we're going to have to get hoods we're going to have to get fire sprinklers and safety systems um we'll have to get a, a three compartment sink in there right so so the plumbing is going to be very different than a, from an at&t store and the layouts can be very different than uh, a restaurant. How much is that going to cost? Who's going to be paying for that too? So, uh, just in the in the the chat, if you guys want to put in, who do you think pays for the actual tenant improvements? If we were going to convert something from, let's say, an AT and T store and convert it into a restaurant, do you think the tenant's going to pay for that, or do you think that the landlord's going to come in and pay for that? And uh, we'll keep moving on while we're compiling that information as well. So how do we get the information that we're looking for in these types of places, right? So uh, what, what about like when we're going to try and figure out what is the consumer spending that's happening in that area? Is there information that we can get? Well, as, as brokers, we have access to some of this information. We use a database called CoStar and CoStar actually compiles that. Um, as individuals, if you don't have access to CoStar, could it is fairly costly. It's about $1,500 to $2,000 per seat per month. Um, so as an individual, it doesn't make sense for you to utilize that. Uh, but this is the CoStar pulls all this information off of consensus reports, right? So the census, if you can access that, this is all public information, you can actually go and you can find this information for yourself. Now, if when we're looking at a report like this, and hopefully everyone can see it, nobody's on their on their phones because it might be a little too small to see those numbers. But from the numbers, what would you open here in this area? As I look at this report, a few things stand out to me. Now, for this particular location, um, I used uh, East Bell Road. This is 2833 East Bell Road is the address that I utilized. Um, for this particular location, I would probably look at a one mile and a three mile radius. The five mile radius is probably a little too far because this is more of an urban area. So let's say looking at the three mile radius. I The first thing that stands out to me is that food and alcohol is 64% higher than the next closest category. So you might think, okay, it would be really good to open up a restaurant or a bar in this location. One of the things, though, when you dive in deeper, even deeper into the food and alcohol aspect of this is that the food at home is the highest subset. So if you're going to open up a restaurant, you better make sure that you're going to have some sort of a delivery option because most of the people here are going to be actually ordering food at home. So you will have a little bit less of people going in and actually ordering uh, in, in the restaurant itself. 
uh, another thing that you want to take a look at is how saturated is this, right? It might be great that, yes, a lot of people are ordering food from home, but maybe there's just too many options in that area. That report's really not going to tell you some of that information. Um, and by the way, Albert is going to be monitoring the chat. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to interact during the, the session. We'll also have a question and answer period at the end of it as well. Um, but yeah, uh, Albert, when, if there are any questions that come up, Albert's going to let me know what questions those are, and we can, we can actually dive in a little deeper and answer those questions for you. Now, the next report that we're going to look at here is the daytime employment report, right? So as a retail business, this is very important. Um, if, you know, if, if anybody here is in Chandler, you probably notice, and even in Tempe, that a lot of the businesses, a lot of the large businesses that were there, like State Farm and PayPal, they no longer go to the office. So what do you think will happen to the consumer spending there? That'll go down. Now, as a landlord, they don't really care too much that PayPal is no longer occupying their building. Why? Because PayPal probably has something like a 10 or 20 year lease and they're on the hook for that. They're still paying that 10 or 20 year lease. Uh, for the landlord, it's actually even better because now they get no wear and tear on their building. They don't have to pay for things like electricity if that's what was included in their lease, but they still get the full lease amount. PayPal can sublease that, but that's now up to them to get that. What does get hurt are the small, medium-sized businesses all around it, right? How many people are now going to the gas station on their way to work? How many people are going out for lunch? Uh, so all those things is what we want to take into consideration too. So the consumer spending has gone down since, since COVID in areas like Chandler, you know, the, the price road corridor in Chandler has gone down quite a bit. The things that stand out to me here, if you look at this on a one mile radius, there's 662 businesses. Now, the those businesses, the majority of them have under 10 employees. So that leads me to believe that most of these businesses in this area are small, medium sized businesses. The next report here is traffic count. So this is a great way. Now you can see what the average vehicle count is for the streets on a daily basis uh, around this particular location. So three, 35,304 people pass by this intersection every single day. That is a really high number, right? 10,000, 15,000 is like a, a, a small street, 35,000 or 30,000 and above is a really busy street. Uh, some things that this report, though, won't show is what is the feel of the neighborhood, right? Uh, the other aspect of this, like what, what other businesses around, um, is, is there any visibility for this particular business, even though there's a lot of cars that pass through the street? Are people actually going to see signs for the business? Are they going to see the business location? Uh, the other aspect that you don't recognize on this is how easy is it to access the ingress and, and egress of the space? So, this one particular space has a guarded left turn on 29th Street. So you can actually have a left turn arrow to be able to get in and you can access the building through 29th Street. The other aspect is that it's got a left turn lane on East Bell Road. So not only can you be able to access it from the side that you're driving on, but if you're coming from the other side, you can easily go in and make a left turn here. That makes a huge, huge difference. I was showing a, a, a gentleman that owns a boba store and he was, look, we were looking at some spaces and uh, we went to this one intersection and all four corners had retail centers in it. But the corner that we were looking at was the one retail center that didn't have a lot of traffic. And one of the biggest reasons is there was no left turn lane on either side from coming from either road. So it was much harder for people to access that. Now let's dive in a little deeper into the demographics. Uh, I don't want to confuse you guys. This is just a lot of information to look at. This is a detailed demographic report. It's probably overkill for a lot of people in their businesses, but this is the kind of details that you can see, right? You can see a summary report of this too. But if you really need to dive in deep, you can see over here, 15.58% of the people in this area in a three mile radius are 65 and plus. Now, one of the things I do caution everybody on, what is like what 15.58? Does that seem like a high number? Does that seem like a low number? You always kind of want to benchmark this stuff, right? So when I took a look and saw what the average was for Arizona, it was 18.8. .8. 
So we're actually over three points lower in this area. So it's a smaller percentage of people that are 65 and over in this area compared to the general population in Arizona. The other thing that I see is the civilian unemployment rate here at 1.86%. That's, I mean, that's ridiculously low, right? But, um, and, and as we know, we got to take that with a grain of salt because unemployment is calculated off how many people are actually on unemployment themselves, right? So are they utilizing the unemployment insurance? Um, some people might be out of a job, but 1.86, that's very low. That means the economy in this area is probably doing fairly well. And then this is the other aspect of the, um, the demographic report. So we're looking at 30.25% of the people here are in professional or management. You can see what kind of industries everybody's in. So you might be able to find a particular niche somewhere and say, hey, this is a really high um, uh, of value of people that are uh, in education and health. Maybe we need to gear towards them for some reason. Maybe there's a lot of teachers in that area. We need to open up a store that gives supplies for teachers, right? The other aspect that I see on this report, which helps us tie into that uh, the spending report as well, is that most of the households are one and two per person households. So likely there's lots of multifamily nearby, um, which lines up with the large food at home in the consumer spending report, right? So we might have young families or young professionals that are living in multifamily homes and apartments, maybe a one bedroom or two bedroom. It might be a, a young couple. And a lot of times they're ordering food at home. So when you look at these reports, what you really kind of want to do is create a narrative and I would create that narrative and then I would go drive that neighborhood and take a look and see, okay, did that narrative play out the way that I thought it was going to? And then you can reconfirm it really by, so you take the quantitative information, you can reconfirm it with the qualitative information that you get. All right, so that's retail, right? And if you guys have any questions on that, feel free to, feel free to put in the question and answer and we can, we can answer those for you or you can wait till the end as well. Now, what about office space? Uh, what are we going to be looking at? Is a consumer spending report important in office space? Probably not, unless you're concerned more about, you know, are your employees going to be able to go out to lunch or run errands? And, and But you probably aren't going to be looking at a consumer spending report. How about visibility? Visibility, you want your clients, if they're coming into your office, to be able to find you. You want, you know, new employees to be able to find you but you're probably not going to pay a premium to be able to get visibility right on an extremely busy street because it's not going to make that much difference to your business. So what factors do you think are most important? So some of them are daytime employment, uh, telecommunications. I think people miss out on that quite a bit. So I think one of the biggest factors is access to the right labor force. Uh, you know, if KPMG is deciding to open up a new office, and they've got their choice between Yuma, Arizona and Phoenix, Arizona, downtown, they're most likely going to choose Phoenix, Arizona, because they've got the labor force that's there. They've got the, the type of people that are they're going to be employing. So that's really going to be the number one thing that I would look at if I was looking at office in consideration. Um, the other aspect now that we look at post-COVID is getting the labor fast force back in the office. So one of the big things that I've noticed as a trend is that in order to get people back into the office, what a lot of the large companies are doing, they're going into buildings that have a lot of amenities, right? And those amenities include anything from a dry cleaner and a daycare all the way up to pickleball courts on the roof and uh, great entertainment like, like nice restaurants, right? Um, because people need a reason now to go into the office because a lot of people work hybrid. So what does that mean for you guys? As a small business, one of the things I would recommend in office, right? You might not be able to afford a building that's going to have a pickleball court in it, but you can afford a co-working space. And that co-working space, as you guys will see more and more, are going to have a lot more amenities. And that's going to attract employees to come in. So it's a great place to kind of start. Um, co-working space, the nice thing about it as well is that fact that you don't have to sign a a three-year or five-year commitment uh, because as a small, medium-sized business, we might be growing. We don't know how many employees are going to be coming in. Uh, and then it's a great way to be able to get uh, a lot of amenities that you're not necessarily paying for because all the other businesses are helping to, to do that as well. The other thing that you want to look for in 
in office spaces is parking. Do you have enough parking for your employees so when they come in, they're not going around for 20 minutes trying to figure out how to find parking? Um, and when you're looking at the parking environment as being in Arizona, the other thing we want to look for is, is the parking covered? Um, or how many spaces are covered? Now, typically when you're negotiating a lease for an office space uh, and they've got some covered parking that you see and it's reserved, normally at that time is when you want to negotiate how many of those spots you could get, right? And that's really going to be dependent on the square footage and what's available there. But let's say you want to get one or two spots for the executives to be able to park in the covered parking. You want to put that into your negotiations at the beginning. The major concern that most employees are going to have is the safety. So when they're leaving the building and they're going to their car, do they feel safe? Is there enough lighting there? Is there a large homeless population that's maybe um, standing around in the parking lot? You know, is it, uh, is it really, really quiet? Are they the only ones going there? And how easy is that to access? So when you're looking at these spaces, always take that into consideration because now you want to take a look at multiple aspects. A lot of people are really just looking at the floor plan and the layout. Um, which is also important, right? Layout, uh, is it individual offices? Do they have a bullpen? Are there conference rooms there? Will the restroom be shared with other businesses or will you have in-suite restrooms? Um, the, and even the conference room, is the conference room going to be shared or are you gonna have your own dedicated conference room? And there's pros and cons for each one, right? You have your own dedicated conference room. You can use it whenever you want. You can have the technology in there that you want. Well, the con is that you have to pay for the technology. You might have to have an IT person now on staff that's going to help you to utilize that. Um, but one of the bigger things that I think a lot of people forget is that if your conference room is inside your suite, you're paying for that square footage, right? And that part, that's part of the square footage now that's in your office. And everything is dictated price per square foot when we talk about commercial real estate. So if that conference room is not in your suite, while well, you're still paying for it in some way, you're sharing that expense with everybody else that utilize that conference room. You're not just directly paying for it yourself within your square footage. Uh, unlike retail um, and even industrial, one of the big things that you, that you want to take a look at in office is rentable square footage and usable square footage because there's a difference, right? So rentable square footage means that's what you're going to be paying your rent based on. Usable square footage means that that's actually the amount of space that you get to utilize. So why is there a difference? Well, you've got things like hallways, you've got common areas uh, like the entranceway uh, and the lobby. All of that stuff, the landlord is not going to be paying for. All that square footage is going to be divided up between the people that are utilizing the office building. Uh, and we call that a load factor. So the load factor, it's easy to figure out. You take the rentable square footage, you divide it by the usable square footage, and you've got the load factor. So let's say we've got 10,000 square feet of rentable square footage. That's what your rent is going to be based on. You divide that by the 8,000 square feet that you actually get to be able to utilize. You've got a load factor of 1.25. Um, also, and you'll hear, the, you'll hear it as 25% load factor, right? So it's 25% uh, uh, you're paying extra in rent that you don't actually get to utilize. Um, I, I used to live in New York City. And the first time I heard the term load factor was when we were looking at a space in the Empire State Building. And uh, that load factor was almost two. So basically 100% uh, load factor close to it is like 1.8. So 80% load factor, which means that we were paying for a lot of space that we weren't actually being able to utilize. So it got really expensive over there. The last thing I would recommend, because you know, you've got a lot of uh, places now that have call centers, they're running that out of, uh, out of their, uh, their offices. Um, they might do a lot of virtual calls, they might do Zoom meetings. Um, so telecommunications is extremely important and not all telecommunications is built equally. So, uh, Two things you want to look at is what is the current telecommunications that you're going to get in that particular office space? Um, and then you might also even want to talk to a consultant to find out what telecommunications can you bring in there because there might be some limitations and you don't want to find that out once you start putting 30 people in that office space and everybody's on the phone at the same time and you find out that you just don't have the bandwidth to be able to handle that even though you've got the space. So it's a big factor that I recommend that you do due diligence on. 
All right. So now there's some people, quite a, quite a few, I think it was 38% of the people have um, a business need that would utilize an industrial space. So industrial space is one of those kinds of terms, even like retail, you know, we've got restaurants all the way from physical therapy offices. Industrial can be uh, a warehouse, it could be light manufacturing, or it can be an oil uh, refinery. So that there's a lot of different aspects and uses that you can use even within the industrial space itself. So, so depending on your business and your business needs, you want to be able to utilize some of these aspects on what you're going to be looking for in your business. And they could include loading docks, can include roll-up doors, um, ceiling height can make a big difference. So one of the one of the things that I get a lot of, right? Um, I get auto auto dealers, auto repair shops saying, um, hey, and even even now uh, pickleball places that are saying, hey, you know what? Instead of me going retail and paying that higher amount for retail, I'd rather just get a warehouse and then I could put my pickleball courts in a warehouse or I can put my detail shop in a warehouse. Well, while that is that's possible, it can be done, right? Um, we, we have to take a look at what the current market conditions are. So in order to do something like that, where we're taking a warehouse space and utilizing it for use that it's really not meant for, we have to do get what's called a special use permit. And the special use permit is something that the city is gonna say, okay, it's not zoned for this particular type of use, but we're willing to make an exception. Uh, and you have to get a traffic study done in order to get that, which is gonna be the cost of the potential tenant. But more importantly than that, you also have to get the landlord's approval, right? And that's why I say we have to look at market conditions now. If this was 2019 in the Valley, it would be fairly easy for us to convince a landlord who's got a vacancy in a warehouse space to say, hey, we wanna put an auto detailing shop. Because at that time, warehouse just wasn't doing that well. In Arizona, and they would say, you know what, whatever you guys want to do, as long as you get the special use permit, um, uh, we're okay with that because they just want to be able to collect rent. Right now in the Valley, we're at less than a 4% vacancy rate in warehouse. 4% is about what you would consider just turnover. You know, like if we look at unemployment, 4% is about that mark where we're like, okay, 4% is basically no unemployment. Essentially, it's just people turning over from one job to another. Same thing in warehouse. It's like 3.7%, I believe, around the valley, which means that some of these spaces are getting actually rented out before they even come on the market over there. So the likeliness of a landlord being willing to give you that uh, special use concession is very, very low right now because they can just get a warehouse, not have to go through a special use permit and not have somebody utilizing their space for what it's not um, intended for. Um, the reason that you look at traffic patterns, when a city zones and they've got the city planning happening, they look at, okay, if we've got a retail area, it's right near a, a freeway, which means that people can access it really easily. There's some really busy roads there. So we're gonna expect 35,000 cars a day coming through this area. When we look at an industrial warehouse space, they're going to be looking at a, in, in this space for the square footage that it has, there's going to be very few 10 employees maybe for 10,000 square feet. So we've got 10 employees coming in at eight or nine o'clock in the morning and leaving at five or six o'clock at night. And in between that time, we've got a lot of semi trucks that are coming in and out of here. Now they don't want to mix consumers and retailer, retail people coming in to be able to, to go to your business and have 35,000 consumer cars coming in the same place that they've got semi trucks coming and doing onloading and offloading. So they got to do a traffic study to see, does that make sense for that particular area? The other aspects that we really want to look at when we're looking at an in, in industrial for its actual use is how heavy is your equipment? Um, and then you might need to get a structural engineer to figure out, is that, does, is that slab going to be able to handle that? Does that need to get reinforced? What are your power needs? Uh, and we'll talk about this in uh, a little bit as well. I had a client that had power needs of 2000 amps. So that limited us on the space that we could really get because there's really not a lot of spaces in, in the Valley that have 2000 amps because we're not meant for heavy, heavy manufacturing. Most of our spaces are meant more for distribution and warehousing. Um, so, but you want to make sure that if you need 2000 amps for your machines that you find a space that has that. 
Uh, the other aspects that you want to look at is, is it AC cooled warehousing or is it EVAP cooled warehousing? Now, if it's air conditioning, obviously you're going to be paying money for that AC system. Uh, you might even be paying for the maintenance of the HVAC units. If it's EVAP cooled, there's probably not a chance, there's not much of an effect that you're going to see in any kind of high humidity or during the summer months in, in the valley right now, because in Arizona, I mean, it gets, in most of Arizona, it gets pretty hot. Now, if we're, you know, in Flagstaff, you got an EVAP cooled warehouse, you're probably going to be okay. In Arizona, you will see a lot of EVAP cooled warehouses, but just think about how much heat the machines are going to have are going to generate and whether your employees are going to be able to work there. Um, you might need to have a roll-up door or multiple roll-up doors that you can open to even get some sort of ventilation coming in from there. And then the other aspect you want to look at is what kind of ventilation is there already? Is there, do you need to do a build out to be able to add ventilation for the use that you need? How easy is it going to be to add that ventilation? Is the landlord going to allow you to do it? You know, if you've got a metal roof building, um, the landlord might not want you to cut a big hole in the metal roof for ventilation. And then the last aspect uh, that I think is extremely important is the ceiling height, right? Because if you're a warehouse and you're going to stack stuff up, well, square footage obviously is going to be important, but what you want to look at even more is the volume. The volume is important because the ceiling height is going to make a big difference. If you've got a 10,000 square foot warehouse with seven foot ceilings, as opposed to 14 foot ceilings, you could stack a lot more in the 14 foot ceilings if you're going to be utilizing it for warehouse. All right. So those are the, the different business uses that we can look at and the questions that you really want to think about when you're looking at each business use. And, and this is why, you, you know, a lot of times you'll see commercial real estate brokers, they're going to be specialized in one, one particular area because they can become a huge expert in everything that you need to look for in that area. Uh, before we move on, any questions so far? Albert, you got anything in the chat box that we can answer now? I do not have anything, but I wanted to circle back, Sam. I know we talked uh, a little bit about retail, office, and industrial, and you had asked uh, the attendees if the responsibility falls on the tenant or the landlord for any build outs. I want to circle back to that. We got a lot of wonderful questions, and maybe uh, some people are kind of wondering who that responsibility falls on, if any. Yeah. So that's a that's a great question, right? Because I think that that was probably one of the biggest questions I had when I was trying to put a business plan together and figuring out spaces. One, my question was, how much is it going to cost me per month? Because how do I put a pro forma without that? And then two, if I find an AT and T store and want to convert it to a restaurant, who's paying for that? So that's a great question. And uh, unfortunately, the 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 most common answer in commercial real estate is it depends. Um, that's negotiable. And we're going to dive in a lot deeper into that too. But I'm glad that people have that question as well. I'm not the only one that that didn't know the answer to that. So it could fall on the landlord. Uh, it could fall on the tenant. That is going to be part of the negotiations that you have in your in your proposal, um, and it's going to be part of the negotiations that you do in the lease. Um, but the tough thing is this: what really dictates that is market conditions, right? So even retail right now is under a four percent vacancy rate. Trying to get concessions from landlords and retail right now are tough. So if you've got a big build out, um, really think about the fact that most likely you're going to be doing a lot of that build out. If you've got an office space and you want to get some concessions in the build out, office is like 16% vacancy right now. Uh, most likely you're going to be able to negotiate that with a landlord, right? So that could change in six months from now, right? So you want to make sure you stay on top of market conditions and you're negotiating um, in, in an area that, that, you know, right. So it, and it, it, like, like I said, 2019 in industrial, you could probably get a landlord to let you convert that into an auto shop. And you might actually even get them to pay for most of that in the tenant improvements. Um, but while I'll dive in a little bit deeper in, the, in that too, but I'm glad you guys have that question. All right. So now that you know what to look for in your ideal spot, Right. Let's see what the landlord would look for to improve you, uh, to approve you as a tenant. Um, so how do you qualify as a tenant? Now, as, this is what I want you guys to think about when let's say you're going to be signing a five year lease on a retail space. The landlord is essentially giving you five years of credit. They're telling you, OK, you can utilize the space. I'm going to contract with you. I'm going to give you the credit 
for those five years to be able to utilize that. They want to make sure that you're going to be successful because the last thing that they want is that space to turn over because of the fact that now they've got vacancy times. They might, they're going to have, might have to pay a broker, a commission fee. Um, they might have to do tenant improvements as well if, if the market, you know, dictates it. So they want to make sure that you're going to be in that space. Um, so take that into consideration because just like anything else, it's not cut and dry exactly what they're going to look for. But there's some, some landlords are very sophisticated. You know, they're owned by REITs. You've got a, a multinational company that owns that property uh, and they've got experts that or and, and they've got processes that they're going to follow every single time. And they've got certain limits. Other landlords aren't as sophisticated. They might just own that one particular property. So it's really about creating a narrative in their mind on what there is. So there's a few things that they're going to look for upfront rent concessions. The landlord will scrutinize even more. So, so there that goes into the tenant improvements, right? So let's say you're a business and you're just starting up right now, um, and you're trying to get a three-year or five-year lease from a landlord. Um, you have no your 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 pre-revenue, so you have no revenue. Um, you're coming from a different industry. You know, maybe you're a consultant, and now you want to open up a doggy daycare. Surprisingly, I see that a lot. So you want to open up a doggy daycare. You have no experience. That landlord's going to take that into consideration. Now, if you're saying, "Hey, I'll take the space as is. You don't have to do any work to it, and I'm not going to change it in any way," the landlord might say, "Okay, go ahead and utilize that space. I don't really care what your qualifications are." Because worst case scenario, I just have to then kick you out and put somebody else in that space. They might need to negotiate with their broker and say, hey, if this guy leaves before 12, 12 months, you know, then you have to find me a new tenant or you got to pay back the commissions. But that's the only the exposure that they're really getting. If the landlord has to put thirty or $50,000 into tenant improvements, well, now they're exposing themselves even more. So they're going to look for a lot. They're going to have a lot more scrutiny in uh, your qualifications. Now, in almost every situation that we're going to run into as small, medium-sized businesses, they're going to look for a personal guarantee. Even if your business has been around for 10 years, they're probably still going to look for a personal guarantee coming from you. If you're a C multinational C-Corp, they're not going to be asking for any kind of personal guarantee there. But uh, essentially for any of us, we're most likely assume that they're going to be asking for personal guarantee, which means that they're going to look at your personal tax returns. They're going to look at your personal assets. They're going to see from those personal assets what's liquid or can be liquidatable. So, you know, if, if it's a house that you live in, most, you know, they'll take that into consideration, but most likely they're not going to say, okay, well, you've got $500,000 of equity in your house. We can get that. It's really difficult for them to kick you out of your house. They can put a lien on it, but they got to wait for you to sell. They're probably going to be third or fourth in line in order to be able to collect that. So they're going to look at how much cash do you have in the bank? Um, is that, are you going to be able to pay the lease, if the business isn't doing well out, out of your personal account, if you can't pay the lease and you can't fulfill your obligations, can they go after you? And they can can they get some of your your personal um, personal money and liquidate that? They'll also they look for experience in the industry. They're going to look look at your credit score. But like I said, this is really going to be more of a narrative, right? Uh, Arizona also is a community property state. That means your spouse will also have to sign, and most of the time you're going to have to have a notary notarize that. So not only are you on the hook, your spouse will be on the hook too. So uh, if you haven't told your spouse about the business or they think that you'll be able to protect your assets that way, unfortunately, in the state of uh, Arizona, we won't, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. Uh, most, most landlords are going to ask for the spouse to sign as well. The other things that I see that here's some things that you can do. Let's say you are a consultant and you're going to start a doggy daycare. Well, if you're going to go to the landlord and say, hey, I've got this plan, I'm going to start a doggy daycare, and you have no business plan, you have no funding, um, you don't have company financials because you're pre-revenue, well, they're not going to look at that very favorably, right? So utilize um, the resources out there, create a business plan. And, and one of the things I see that lack in a lot of business plans um, are the pro formas. Uh, it, it's great that you might have expenses, you know, compiled as this is what we expect for the 12 month expenses to be. Break that down so the landlord can see you've actually done a, a, a lot of due diligence on that. And I personally recommend having the first 12 months cash flow statement as well, because they want to see how are you going to ramp up and when will you get to a point where your business can actually sustain the expenses that you have. Uh, and, and that's really what the landlord's going to look for as a risk.
So we do have some questions. Sam wanted to jump right in here. Go for um, it. So we have an attendee that is asking, you mentioned office to auto build out. How reasonable is this for zoning changes? Would this be based on an exception? Yeah. So, so let's say, let's say in industrial to auto is probably the one I see the most or in, industrial is what a lot of people want to utilize special use for. Um, so do you, did they say office to auto build out? Office to auto build out. Yes. Um, it's, that's a tough one, right? So an office to auto build out, what we really want to look for is like an office condo. So that might be potential. Now the problem with office to auto build out that I'm going to look at even in an office condo is um, where are you going to be now? If Are you going to be bringing vehicles into the building? Now, when you say office to auto build out, I'm going to assume, because I see this a lot, that we're talking probably at a, as an auto dealer, right? I see a lot of used car dealers now that are online. And if you want to jump in, let me know if this is correct. I see a lot of used car dealers that are online and really what they want to do, they want to be able to get a dealer's license. They want to hang that dealer's license somewhere, which means that they need C3 zoning in order to hang that dealer's license. Um, and they want to be able to park some vehicles there, right? So maybe five vehicles, they might have another place where they store some of their cars. So when a client comes in, they've got two, three, four, five vehicles for them to choose from in the actual office location. It's possible. Um, you're not going to really get a landlord to give you permission to cut a hole on the in the side of the wall to be able to put like a rolling roll up door to be able to get the cars in there and do auto detailing in an office build out. Um, and I see why you asked that question because office has such a high vacancy rate and landlords might be a little bit more motivated. Um, but what you're going to run into for something like that is the C2 and C3 zoning. In the municipalities, so that's going to depend on the municipality. There are certain there are certain cities um, like Phoenix is a little easier, Mesa is a little easier to be able to get those kind of exceptions. So let's say you do need C three zoning to be able to hang a dealer's license somewhere, and you've got an office space, um, you might be able to get the city to agree to that. What's going to be a little tougher is for you to get the landlord. To agree to something like that. You're really going to have a lot of scrutiny in your lease. They're going to say something like you can only have up to four vehicles there. You can't be working on any of the vehicles there. Um, so that lease is going to be pretty tight. So it's going to depend on what you really want to use it for, for that auto. Um, we have done, and there's, there's actually a consultant in Arizona um, who is able to take different zonings and help get special use permits to make them into C3 to hang your dealer's license. So if you're going for a dealer's license, there is a, there's a way to do it. It's um, it's a bit of a long process. It doesn't cost a ton. This consultant charges like $500 for you to do something like that. Um, the other thing that you might want to look for is maybe find like a 500 square foot office space that has a C3 zoning to be able to put your dealer's license and then find a warehouse nearby that you can actually store your vehicles in. Right. And if maybe that might have some lifts that you can work on those vehicles too, that's a way to get around it. Now with, with that, obviously wherever your dealer's license is, is where you have to negotiate the deals. You can't bring your clients to that warehouse. Technically, you got to make sure all the vehicles come to them. Right. So there's ways um, it's just depending on what you're looking for in build out, but yeah, it would be tough to convert it to auto depending on what kind of auto use that you're looking for. Awesome. And hey, oh, Go ahead. Yeah. Any other questions on the on the qualifying? I know a lot of people. This is always a, a, a tough thing. It's like, well, how do I know if I'm going to qualify or not? It's it's really hard. You don't you won't necessarily. Um, we do have a couple more questions here. I guess I can switch gears to maybe that qualifying question. So we have uh, Mindy in the chat that asks or says, "I have five years of experience under another mobile home broker and now have opened my own dealer license. Does that have a monetary value?" Also, will it bring clients to the plaza to benefit other plaza tenants? Tenants. Um, it it could. I don't think that the I don't think really as a landlord they're going to say okay you know somebody's going to come and buy a mobile home and then they're going to go to the boba spot and drink some boba as well. It's just not that kind of a cross uh, sell as easily. So not necessarily the big thing that they're going to really look for is how much parking space are you gonna be utilizing, right? And now does it look like uh, a car lot on there as well? The other aspect that you really gotta take into consideration that's a little bit tough in this type of situation 
is that let's say you've got a used car lot. Technically, all the vehicles that are on your lot, even a new car lot, all the vehicles that are on your lot, unless they're specified that they're not for sale, have to be for sale. So you have to be able to have that kind of like a almost a fenced in area. So consumers come in, they know which vehicles are for sale and which aren't. Now, you said it was mobile home, so it's probably a little easier for them to figure out that, okay, you know, the, the Mustang is probably not for sale, but the mobile home is. Um, so that's the difficulty. The other aspect that you really have to think about on this stuff too um, is especially if they're used, right? Uh, the landlord doesn't know what kind of leaks that car is going to have. Coolant leaks, it's going to have gas leaks, and that can drastically change the value of that property when they go to sell it. Because then there, you know, there's probably going to be a phase one environmental study done. Phase one meaning that they just look and see are there leaks around. If they see something, they might have to do phase two environmental study. Um, being that it was utilized for parking used vehicles, they might automatically the the buyer might automatically do a phase two study, meaning they actually have to core drill and take a look and see has there been any seepage down there. Um, and the reason they do that is because. Even, even if they weren't the ones that owned the property at the time that it had the issue, now that they're a property owner, whenever that issue comes, environmental issue, um, anybody that's ever owned that property is now going to be liable for it. So they want to make sure that they can say, okay, we've mitigated it from here on out. It's the previous owners that are liable. We're not liable anymore. So it's the, it, it's a tough situation. In general, I would say no, it's not a benefit. It's going to be difficult for you to find that kind of space. Realistically, you want to look for uh, like a standalone building that might have good yard space. Fantastic. Um, right. We do have a couple, but I want to be mindful of uh, your content, Sam. So what do you think? Yep. Are you able to take a question or two? Yeah, more? absolutely. Or, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have Eli asking, what about subleasing from an existing tenant who has too much space and wants to lease part of their space for much cheaper than the landlord charges? What are the options? Yeah, I mean, you're really going to be seeing that right now in office space. If you're looking for office space, you can most likely get a pretty decent deal. Now, the difficult thing is this, okay? We got to look at office space in a couple different ways. The When we look at vacancy rates in office at 16%. The numbers get skewed a little bit because PayPal has 150,000 square feet of office space that they're not utilizing. So the 16% is based upon how much square footage is available and what is uh, uh, available in that, what's being sublet in that. Now, PayPal, even though they've got 150,000 square feet, if you come in and say, hey, I want to you know, rent 5,000, 3,000 square feet of office space from you, it's not worth their time to even put that contract in place and have that liability. Because when you look at a sublease, you have to realize that the person who owns the, there's three uh, parties involved. We've got the landlord, we've got the original lessee, and we've got the sub lessee. The original lessee is now sandwiched in between the landlord and you. They still hold the lease and they're still responsible. So if you don't pay, they still have to pay. If you damage the building and you damage the interior, they're going to have to pay the landlord. So it is possible, definitely, that you can get really good deals, um, especially if the company's a bit desperate, right? And they're going out of business. So you want to take all those factors into consideration. You're not going to leverage PayPal. But if you've got somebody that's got a 3,000 square foot office space and now their business has gone away, right? Maybe they want to, if they can recover half of that, that might be good, right, for them. So if they can get 1,500 for them, it's like, okay, now, the other aspect of this too is in almost every lease with the sub lessee, the, not only do you have to get approval from the person that holds the current lease, the landlord has to approve that too. So you've got two scru you've got two places you're going to get scrutinized. And if the landlord doesn't think you're as qualified as the person holding the lease, they probably won't lease that space to you. So you got to be almost as qualified, if not more qualified, than the person that's leasing that space to you. Fantastic, Sam. Thank you. Yep. All right. So what? What kind of costs are associated right now as business people, especially as small businesses, we want to pro forma. We want to create business plans um, while we're entrepreneurs and we're willing to take risks. We want to mitigate those risks too. So we want to be able to prepare for any of the costs that you're going to incur. So there's a few costs that are up front and we'll get more into the tenant improvements right here. Um, you always pay your rent at the beginning of the period. So you're, you know, up front, you're going to have your first month's rent. You're also going to have a deposit. 
And the deposit is equal, typically equal to the last month's rent at the end of the term of your lease. It is not the last month's rent. Some people make that mistake. They're like, I've already paid the last month. No, you still have to pay your last month and then you get your security deposit back after that. It could be higher. Um, it, some landlords might say, okay, you don't really qualify or we see that um, you, know, you don't have a lot of money in the bank. We're going to take a higher security deposit. I don't see that very often. Some people say, okay, maybe I'll just triple the security deposit. That'll make up for the deficiency in experience or revenue. Most of the time, it doesn't happen. I've seen it happen once in the last 12 months so far where they asked for triple the deposit and they were able to, able to get the space. Um, the other aspects is the TI allowance, right? This is what I think a lot of people have questions on. So the TI allowance, the tenant can pay up front, the landlord can pay. Um, this is where it come, it, it helps to utilize a broker. Now, obviously I'm biased in that as, as I am a break broker, uh, but before I got into commercial real estate, I wouldn't have, I would have no idea what could be negotiated um, and whether or not what I'm asking for is something that's that's relevant in the current market. You, if you go into a retail space right now and you want a three-year lease and you're going to ask for tenant improvements from the landlord to do it, most likely they're not even going to engage with you to the point where they might not even counter your offer. They'll just say, it's too ridiculous. We don't even want this tenant, right? So here's what I want you to think, think about in a TI allowance um, in, in any market. If you've got a three-year lease, the landlord is looking at, and when I say three-year lease, it's your, your original commitment without any options or anything. You've got a three-year lease, the landlord's going to collect this much amount from you over the course of that three years. If you have a five-year lease, they're going to collect this much from you over that five-year lease. Now, on a three-year lease, they might give you this much in tenant allowance. They might not give you anything. On a five-year lease, they might give you a little bit more because they're looking at it just like any other business would. How much am I going to collect in total? How much do I have to spend to collect that money? What is the percentage left that I get to keep on that? And what is the risk involved? Because if they're going to be paying for tenant improvements up front, that's obviously a lot of risk involved. It might take them six months to a year to be able to collect the money from your rent before they actually become whole on those tenant improvements and any other costs that they have to pay like brokerage fees uh, and commissions to be able to get that. Tenant uh, uh, improvements can work a bunch of different ways. So you could go in and, and this is going to be negotiated. We'll talk about this in the process, but this is going to be negotiated in the proposal or we call the LOI, the letter of intent. Um, it, it's basically, you're going to spell out what tenant improvements are going to be done and who's going to do those tenant improvements. So we might say, okay, before we move into the space, we want the landlord to knock down this wall and this wall and put a door in this space. Um, and then the landlord say, okay, we'll go ahead and do that, but we'll cap that at $15,000 or $5,000 of tenant improvements. Um, and the landlord will pay for that themselves up front. There's no cash flow coming out of you. The other way that it can be done is the landlord says, okay, we'll allow you to do those improvements, but you got to pay for them. We're not going to give you any money for that whatsoever. Um, and then another way that it could be done too is they'll say, we'll go ahead and we'll give you a tenant improvement allowance. Now, this is the hardest one that people don't realize. That means that you're going to have to pay for those tenant improvements up front. And then after those improvements are done, you're going to submit receipts to the landlord. The landlord's then going to reimburse you um, pretty much at the time that they want to reimburse you. So it's not going to help your cash flow in that. What I recommend in that type of a situation for, for my clients typically is that instead of asking for the tenant improvement allowance, ask for rent concessions. So ask for three months of uh, abated rent, meaning that you're not going to pay rent for the first three months, uh, and then it'll help your cash flow. You'll be able to use that money to then put into your tenant improvements. Um, and abated rent is different than free rent. Abated basically means that it's going to be added on to the end of your term. So if you've got a 36-month term, you get three months abated rent. Your first three months, you're not paying any rent. Uh, but now it becomes a 39 month term. It's a win win for you for cash flow. Uh, but the landlord themselves, they actually collect more money because uh, you're going to have escalations at the end of the, every year in your lease. So that extra three months is going to be a higher rental rate. Excellent. Well, Sam, we are right at time. Um, so if we can just share your contact information on the screen. And as a friendly reminder to everyone who joined us today, that Sam's presentation. 
and contact information will be available on the Arizona Commerce Authority's website as part of our small business bootcamp content library. Uh, so thank you all so much for your questions. I'm glad we were able to address some of those today. If you had some outstanding questions, again, Sam's contact information will be made available for you. So thanks, Sam, for sharing that on the screen. Again, this will be available on our website. Um, so thank you again, Sam. I know we had some great conversation and engagement. So it's definitely a conversation we will revisit here on the boot camp, I am sure. But for yep. those of you, please be back here next Tuesday as we jump into brand authenticity. So thank you again for spending your morning with us, Sam. Thanks. And we'll see you all again next week. Have a great day. Thank you.